Today's case is about a string of unsolved attacks that were solved when a serial killer entered the home of the McDonough family, a family who fought this man to save their daughter's life. This is a story full of inspiring victims and survivors who deserve to be known, because this family believes that his prior victims helped them fight the killer off that day. Now a quick word from our sponsor who supports this channel. Dime Beauty is a beauty brand that is perfect if you're like me and are trying to find the perfect skincare that's actually clean for your skin this year. Dime has every ingredient and their products listed on their website, no added fragrances, not to mention it's cruelty free. You know exactly what you're putting on your face, which is why I love it. There, the work system, it's this whole routine. So there's a lot of dryness going on a lot from the winter. My skin is dry, but in the winter it just gets so cracky. Okay, so I've been using Dime consistently and I was just looking in the mirror and was like, oh my God, I had to show them because this is now my makeup with dry skin during the winter and like it looks so much better. It actually looks dewy and I literally didn't change anything but my skincare. I've been using the Hyaluronic acid serum every single day for the moisturizer i've been using the dewy day cream during the day and then during the night the restorative night cream i've been love you don't have to worry if it's not something that's working for you because they offer 60 day returns and 100 percent satisfaction guarantee so you can get 20 percent off with the code brooke mckenna go to dimebeautyco.com slash brooke mckenna you are such a genuine gem thank you for clicking on my video i'm brooke mckenna today's case is about a group a family of brave survivors they actually end up writing a book called caught in the act a courageous family's fight to save their daughter from a serial killer now it's actually dedicated to their daughter shame mcdonough and it says her beauty lies not only in the resilience of her spirit but also in the strength of her character throughout this tumultuous journey she has remained true to herself and has not allowed the negativity of the past events alter her perspective towards life wherever her path may lead may angels continue to watch over her they have actually stated in this book that's an amazing read by the way i will have a link down below please go and support them by buying their book by reading it by learning their story from their own words and they have have spoken about that this was really a test of inner strength and character but it proved to them the clarity of spirit and that clarity of spirit has proven to be a life-altering event just as the attack was. Overall, they hope that their experience benefits others, so I will have that book linked down below. This is not just about their story of survival, it's also about the victims who passed, the other victims that survived, and it is all around what these women experienced due to the hands of this monster. So I'm so grateful that they took the time to write out their story and I cannot wait to share it with you today. So it was 2007 in Massachusetts and the McDonough family lived in Chelmsford. This was a town known for a very low crime rate. You didn't need to lock your doors. You didn't have to worry about walking outside on your own. Though around this time, two hours away in Cheshire, Connecticut, the news broke of a vicious, deadly attack. Now, this was on July 24th of 2007 when two men had kept a family hostage for six hours, strangling the mother to death, sexually assaulting the girls before tying them to their bed, setting them on fire. And the father had actually been beaten to death in the basement of the house, and then they were all set aflame, though they didn't realize that the father had survived, he escaped, but the rest of the family had passed. This actually became the infamous Pettit family murder case that a lot of people know about now, but at this time it was breaking news and this had shaken the McDonough family in a way that they had never experienced before. But they had no idea that this could actually have prepared them for what was to come. See, the McDonough family consisted of Jeannie and Kevin, who had met in high school. They had fallen in love. Then they had a son named Ryan, and at this time, a 15-year-old daughter named Shay. This was a normal family who would soon be experiencing coming face-to-face -face with a serial killer intent on hurting their youngest child. 
Only five days after the news broke about this vicious attack, July 29th of 2007, the parents headed home from a Sunday night dinner. They had just gone, the two of them. And when they got home, the mother, Jeannie, she would sit down to watch the Red Sox game. While Kevin was headed to bed, he was falling asleep. But their daughter, Shay, had returned home just prior to her curfew that night. She was hanging out with a friend. So she arrived back home at around 11.45. Her curfew was midnight. It was perfect timing. She entered through the back door and everyone headed to bed. However, around 4 a.m., so this was July 30th, Jeannie would say that she had woken up hearing a whimpering sound coming from where Shay was sleeping. And Kevin actually woke up to hearing this and they decided that maybe Shay was having a nightmare so they were going to go to check on her together. They didn't think much of it so they actually both walked over there in their underwear. What they were wearing to sleep, they didn't cover themselves up. They didn't have a reason to. They were just quickly checking on their daughter. Kevin would later say that he felt like he should go with his wife that night when she was going to go check on their daughter and thank goodness he did because when they opened the bedroom door where their daughter was sleeping there was a black silhouette standing over her with a knife kevin asked who are you and at this point this man began going at kevin and kevin and the intruder began fighting with kevin telling Jeannie to get the knife away from this man she was trying with her bare hands to grab the knife away while her husband and this man continued to fight meanwhile shay was calling 911 after her father told her to do so he also told her to go and get the gun shay told the dispatcher a man came in with a gun and put it to my mouth she was told to relax by the dispatcher and was asked if he was still there at this point though shay screamed. When first responders arrived, there was blood all over this bedroom. The family was still mid-fight with this intruder and they weren't backing down. And so an officer actually busted into the house, not waiting for backup, grabbed the intruder from Kevin and brought him down with his gun. He said that if the intruder moved, he would blow his head off. The family was in complete shock even though this man had been taken down. They didn't even know what kind of person that they had just dealt with. When the paramedics attended to Jeannie's hands, which were all cut up from where she was trying to grab the blade, the intruder was in the cop car and yelled out to her that she had done that to herself. So as Jeannie and Shay went to the hospital for their injuries, the intruder was being arrested and taken down to the police station. What nobody knew at this point, the family nor investigators, was that 17 days prior to the McDonough family attack, an attack had occurred six hours away in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. At this point, there was no reason for investigators to be connecting these two cases. It was two completely separate police departments. But on July 13th of 2007, 42 year old Darlene Ewalt was at her home. She was on her patio. She was talking on the phone and her family was inside sleeping because she would stay up late at night talking to her friend on the phone. She was out there around 2 a.m. But that is when Darlene would be murdered. Darlene's friend, whom she was on the phone with, ended up calling the police after he had heard a muffled sound and then Darlene or someone hung up. It ended up that her throat was slit and that she was stabbed to death. This victim didn't even have a chance to fight back. Her husband and two children were inside the home, but they hadn't heard anything and they were devastated, especially because investigators were suspecting her husband, Todd. Investigators believe that this was done by someone very close to her, that it was personal. However, her children did not believe in any way that their father could have done this to her and their mother had no enemies. So while this case was under investigation, they had no idea that six hours away in Massachusetts, another shocking attack would occur. 17 days later. And now in Massachusetts, they had a man in custody who they should be looking into for Darlene's murder as well, instead of blaming it on her husband. Instead, her husband was to appear in front of a grand jury by September of 2007. So two months after this. However, after the attack on the McDonough family, the Massachusetts police were combing through the residence. They were finding weapons that were brought by this intruder and this was including Chinese throwing stars, choking wires, and a mask. He also had a 15 inch hunting knife that he had used on Shay and was holding during that fight, and then he had another one with him as well. Investigators could not believe that this 160-pound father and 135-pound mother were able to subdue this 245-pound man during that fight. He was a huge man. 
But as he was taken down to the police department, the detective would actually tell the family that this man smelled so horribly that they had to crack the door open in the interrogation room, but it wasn't like he smelled like he wasn't showering. The investigators believed that they recognized the smell, the smell of decomposing tissue. And spoken to about that night, the McDonough family would explain how they miraculously survived. Shay would admit that she left that back door unlocked on purpose because she knew her brother Ryan normally came home after her. He was not yet home, and normally he would text her saying, can you come unlock the back door so I can get in? So she decided that night she wasn't going to wait for his text. She was tired, so she kept the door unlocked for him. Now, unfortunately, the parents didn't have time to tell Shay that Ryan was staying the night at a friend's house. So Shay actually slept downstairs that night in the guest room rather than upstairs in her bedroom because there was an air conditioning unit downstairs. It was hot and she wanted to be down there and this was actually right next door to her parents' room. Shay would state that she had woken up in the middle of the night to something cold on her neck and when she opened her eyes, she saw a mask with dark eyes looking back at her. And a male voice stated, if you make any effing noise, I'm going to kill you. Upon hearing this, Shay would say that she started kicking. She was a swimmer, so she had very strong legs. So she started kicking the bed and this actually made it hit against that wall, the wall that led to her parents' bedroom. However, when her parents got there, she realized that this man was going to go after them and she noticed that this man was three times the size of her father. And when she was told by her father to go and grab the gun, The whole family knew there was no gun to grab. They didn't have a gun. They were just playing it off, hoping that this would make this man stop. Shay remembered that during this time of the fight, her father was able to calm this man down, but then all of a sudden he would freak out again. And after the 911 call that Shay made, she actually ran outside to flag down the officer to get them to come in as quickly as possible. And the first officer actually arrived only four minutes after that call and didn't wait for backup. He barged in to help Kevin. Now, Kevin would later say that he was so good at fighting because he was actually a wrestler. So he knew how to do that chokehold and he knew that was the only way to hold this man down. But when he did so, he actually pulled this man to the floor. And that is when Jeannie would try to grab the knife, however she could. And so she was grasping at the actual blade, not the handle, and she refused to let go. Both of them were determined to save their daughter. But the McDonough family would say that this intruder had a Southern accent and he would tell them that he just wanted money. However, he was also saying he was a nobody and to let him go but Kevin said that he was not going anywhere. Then the man tried to get Jeannie to leave, saying that she needed to attend to her wounds, that she was hurt, but she refused to leave Kevin alone. They were determined to be survivors that night, but they weren't the only ones who would survive this man. Because we spoke of a murder that occurred 17 days prior to this attack, but only 12 days prior to this attack, there was a woman who would know of a very similar horror story because she had lived it too. On July 17th, 2007, Patricia Brooks was stabbed while sleeping on her couch. She had survived, but the attacker had gotten away. She would describe him as a white man with a pop belly who wore a hat and black cert-like pants, which looked like a prison guard uniform. Now, this was in York County, Pennsylvania, which was less than an hour from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where Darlene Ewald had been murdered four days prior to that. But after Darlene was murdered, after Patricia Brooks survived, the McDonough family wasn't the next victim. 12 days after Patricia had survived, a woman was murdered in her bedroom. This was Monica Mazzaro, who lived in Bloomsbury, New Jersey, two hours from where Patricia was attacked. Monica was 37, she lived alone, she owned a cleaning business, and her friends and family said that she was kind-hearted and loving, but she had been stabbed in the head, neck, and chest, and her throat had been slit. Investigators found, though, that she had lived close to a truck stop. Well, the next step was to look at the people that were at the truck stop, particularly at the time that we believe that this murder happened, um, which again was looking like looking for a needle on a haystack. Though at this point, they had very little evidence to go on. And so not only was Darlene and Patricia's attacks unsolved, so is Monica's. One day after Monica's murder, 
Shay would be the next target in Massachusetts. But because none of these had been connected yet, it was unknown if this was premeditated or if he was stalking his victims, if this attack was specifically for the McDonough family. But investigators strongly believed that he had a motive of sexual assault. However, he was adamant that he was not there to do so. At this point, there were two murder victims and two survivors but really it was one survivor and a family of survivors. But this man would be identified as 43-year-old Adam Leroy Lane, a man who lived in a trailer in North Carolina with his wife and his three daughters, ranging from six to 13. However, he was often traveling due to being a long haul truck driver. He had dropped out of school as a teen and he also worked as a chicken plant worker, but he had gotten his commercial driver's license back in 1993 even though during that time his personal license had been put on probation twice due to his speeding. But he began to drive for the Smiths Brothers trucking at this point and had been doing so for years. Five days after his arrest on August 2nd, the search of the intruder's truck was approved and it had been found on a rest area on Interstate 495. And this is when investigators found more knives in his truck as well as receipts and a DVD player with a movie inside. The movie that this intruder was watching was called Hunting Humans, about a serial killer who has no motive for killing people. So a Massachusetts detective, George Tyros, would reveal that this man had been looking for a victim in their town for five hours that night before landing on the McDonough family. That the McDonough house was actually the fourth that the victim had tried to enter with all of the others being locked. That he had driven his truck down I-495 and decided to stop. And when he came across this first unlocked door, he was wearing all black with mask and gloves, and then he attacked. Now, they knew he was stalking other homes because a woman had actually called 911 that night saying that a man was peering in through her daughter's window trying to break into her home. However, once the cops arrived, he was gone. Though Adam Leroy Lane, he had no criminal record, at least nothing huge. Some were speeding tickets, some were writing bad checks, trespass charge, but that was it. But a week after the McDonough family attack, they had to see their intruder in court and there was no identifying him as their attacker because they had held him until the police came. So it was very obvious that this was the man who had come into their home. So he was actually placed behind glass during this hearing. But in the family's book, they spoke about this time saying that it was infuriating to actually hear the defense trying to create doubt in Shay's story due to the 911 call that she had made. She spoke about it having a gun pointed at her and the defense was saying the intruder never had a gun. Though Shay had spoken that she didn't know if it was a gun or a knife. But the defense attorney then asked the judge to grant Adam Lane $10,000 bail because he was not a flight risk. However, he was then held without bail. And an all points bulletin was sent out all over the country for police departments that possibly had similar cases due to the fact that this was a long haul truck driver. Immediately, they were told about the murder of Monica Mazzaro by the detective working on her case. Investigators there in New Jersey wanted to know if Adam had gone there on his route. So the Massachusetts Police Department went through all the evidence again, and one of the receipts they had found in his truck was from Bloomsbury, New Jersey, where Monica lived. And at that point they said, what's the date? I gave them the date and it was total silence on the other end of the phone. Surveillance footage was then found from that night at a nearby truck stop, which placed him in the area as well. So the New Jersey police working on Monica's murder came up to Massachusetts and they wanted to interview Adam Lane, who was quickly talking to them, saying things like, they took movies that I had in my truck and made it seem like I was the worst mass murderer that you've ever seen in your life, just because I like horror movies. However, when he was pressed on the murder about Monica, he shut down and told them to leave. But investigators were then asked to come back in by Adam and he stated, that this was going to kill his family. He then confessed to her murder, but claimed that he didn't mean to hurt her, that the knife was simply a scare tactic, but when they were wrestling, it slit her throat and that she bled out instantly. 
He said he then mutilated her body to make it look like a sex crime. Though so he said that he was never out for sexual joys because he loved his wife too much. He stated he went to that home to rob her because the family finances were going downhill after his back injury. He stated, I know I'm driving the nails in my own coffin, but you wanted the truth. This is the best I know how to describe it, and I'm trying not to die. I'm trying to tell you it was an accident. I was looking for money. I was losing everything I had. I don't have much, didn't have much, and now I've lost everything, including my family. You all should get a big conviction off this. They now had him for the McDonough family attack as well as Monica Mazzaro's murder. And that's when they began to submit all of the evidence for DNA testing, specifically his knives. And when the results came back, it shocked everyone because not only was Monica's DNA found on one of the knives confirming that he did murder her, but so was another woman's. This was Darlene Ewalt, a mother who had been murdered on her patio. It turned out to be his first victim, at least that we know of. So when investigators in Darlene's murder were informed, the first thing they did was go to Darlene's husband, Todd, and apologize for believing that he killed her. Thankfully, he no longer had to go to trial. It had also been found that Adam had been pulled over by police for traffic violations the night of Darlene's murder nearby. So now they had him for the McDonough attack as well as the murder of Monica and the murder of Darlene. And soon enough, the survivor Patricia Brooks would come forward about her horrific experience with this man, that she woke up with this man standing over her and something sharp was being driven into her right shoulder. She screamed and tried to stand up, but this object was then brought across her throat. So she grabbed her throat, sat down on the couch, and she pretended to be dead. She watched the intruder leave before she ran upstairs to her family living up there and asked for help. She was lucky to survive as doctors told her that an inch deeper and that she would have died instantly. So Patricia identified Adam from a lineup and it was found that Adam was making deliveries on his truck route only a few miles from her home. The gloves from Adam's truck were then tested for DNA and Patricia's DNA was found on them. It was found that Adam Lane was still wearing the same clothes from Monica's murder and the attack of Shay and her family the day after. The McDonough family was then asked to come down to the police department where they were informed that their intruder was a killer who had just killed a woman a day prior to their attack. These attacks had been across Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, and he was dubbed the highway killer. But when his crimes were released to the public, many who had contact with him wanted to come forward and tell a little bit about him, especially his time as a trucker. There was one restaurant and waitress specifically who claimed that he was always coming in there to eat. It was a restaurant for truckers called Jordan's County Restaurant on Interstate 77. Now, one of the waitresses said that she had really gotten to know this customer and that Adam would even joke with her saying things like, hey, pain in the butt, get my diet Mountain Dew. And she claimed that she would have never thought he was a psychopath. But his boss for Smith's Brothers Trucking would say that he was short-fused and nobody wanted to work with him or ride with him because he was overbearing. And a coworker even said that he had a bad disposition on everything and he just wanted to argue. Even Adam Lane's neighbors came forward to claim that he was pleasant enough. They often saw him playing with his daughters outside in the front yard of the home. However, his ex-wife, Miriam, she had a whole different view of him to tell. You see, she told Telegram that during their six-year marriage, he physically abused her once and verbally abused her all the time. She said he was often playing with Chinese throwing stars and daggers that he would toss at walls. She claimed, though, that he thought that women were beneath him, that he had an explosive temper, and that he even abused his own mother and would cuss her out. About a year into their marriage, she said that he started cheating on her, and they got into an argument, and he slapped her in the head. And she had told him, old man, you never hit me again. You're a dead man. And his response was chilling. He said, I can kill you and play off crazy as a bat and get away with it. They wouldn't do a thing to me. Now, they divorced in 1994. And five years after that, in 1999, a man named David Rigney was killed. And Adam Lane was to blame. This was eight years before his murder spree or attack spree in 2007. But back in 1999, Adam was said to be driving his truck along the road when 81 year old David Rigney pulled out his minivan in front of the trucker. Now he was instantly killed and it was deemed a 
accidental death. Adam had to undergo surgery due to this accident and a metal rod and screws were inserted into his spinal column and he was out of work for quite a while. In fact, he sued his employer and won $130,000. During his time off, though, he would get a married woman pregnant. This was Regina Davis, who then moved in with him and her two daughters from the previous marriage, and they were still together when Adam was caught attacking the McDonough's. However, Adam Leroy Lane's mother doesn't believe that he could have done any of this. She told the Associated Press, not my son. Thankfully, they had the evidence to convict him. And for Monica's murder, he was sentenced to 50 years in New Jersey. This is the matter of State versus Adam Lane. This defendant showed absolutely no mercy toward Monica Massaro, who brutally cut her throat, watched her die, and then desecrated her dead body. I ask that the court show no mercy towards the defendant now. We don't know why a person who is a husband and a father um, suddenly uh, commits these kind of acts. Oh, Your Honor, um, the mother of the victim wished to have a statement read to the court. Monica lit up every room and every part. He should get down on his knees every day and pray that God has more mercy on his soul than he showed Monica. You are sentenced to serve 50 years in the New Jersey State Prison. For Darlene, she was sentenced to life in prison in Pennsylvania. And he was also given 10 to 12 years for the attempted murder of Patricia Brooks. For Shay's attack, the rape charge was actually dropped because Adam pled guilty in a plea deal. And this plea deal was given to him because the McDonough's didn't actually want Shay to have to testify. So they agreed to this. And Adam said he agreed because he didn't want his wife to think that he was unfaithful. Now, Jeannie, the mother, told the court that she thanks God every day that she didn't listen to this misguided intruder and his words about being a nobody just to let him go. But they were also saying that they may have not have heard their daughter's screams if their air conditioner wasn't broken that night. The McDonough family believe that God sent Adam Lane to their home so that they could stop him. Jeannie spoke directly to Adam saying, realize this, Adam Leroy Lane, that someday you will be held accountable, not only in a court of law. So Adam pled guilty to home invasion, armed assault in a dwelling, assault with intent to murder, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, and he was sentenced to 25 to 30 years in Massachusetts. However, investigators believe they might have found another murder connected to this man. Because investigators in North Carolina, where Adam and his family lived, claimed that they wanted to question him about another murder. This had happened back in 1996, when Police Sergeant Gregory Keith Martin had been shot in his cruiser. He had pulled over a pickup truck which had been stolen, and he hadn't reported the driver's license of the person he pulled over before he was killed. But witnesses had seen this man and provided a sketch all those years ago and created a sketch of a bearded man with a red baseball cap that looked eerily similar to Adam Leroy Lane. After looking further into this though, investigators in North Carolina didn't have enough evidence to charge Adam Lane. And then a few years later, an arrest was made in Gregory Keith Martin's murder. And, but this was not Adam Lane. This was actually a man named Scott Vincent Sicca. Physical evidence connected him to the murder that happened 16 years prior. And he also had two accomplices because they were planning on robbing a restaurant before they were pulled over by the officer. So that murder was obviously not committed by the highway killer, Adam Lane. However, it is theorized that he may have many other victims and survivors all over the country. The McDonough's have spoken about how this traumatized their family for years to come. They went on, I survived a serial killer to talk about it, which I will link down below. But the family has spoken about how for a long time, Shay felt guilty that she had survived and the others hadn't. She said that she was only 15, but she suddenly realized what was important in life. Her mother said for a long time, she didn't want to get out of bed. She was terrified of people looking in the window. She was terrified all around. Eventually, she even tried to go to college, but she did move back in with her parents because she realized she wasn't ready to be away from them. The family had installed home security after this. They kept their children even closer. Shay was working as a nanny for the next door neighbors, keeping their children safe. But as Shay began to heal, she has never forgotten to say, I love you before going anywhere because you never know what's gonna happen. And her brother, Ryan, who was actually out of the home for this, but the reason that she left the the door unlocked wishes that he could have been there that night to protect them. Jeannie has said that her husband is a hero. He saved their daughter's life. He saved her life. He saved his own life. 
However, the family overall doesn't want to be looked at as heroes, according to their book. They think of themselves just as a fortunate family. And when this family thinks about the murder victims of Adam Lane, Darlene, and Monica, they have said, I say my prayers and I thank these women for being in that bedroom with us that night. I really do believe that they were there with us and that they helped us. Which I think is absolutely beautiful for them to believe. Oh, the thought that those victims wanted their killer to be caught and wanted this family to survive and could have been there guiding them on exactly how to catch this man. This is truly a beautiful family of survivors and their story deserves to be told so I'm so glad that they wrote this book. Please go and read it. Please go and support them because without them how many more victims, survivors would there have been of this man? How long would it have taken to catch a serial killer? Would he have ever been caught? Would these three other victims have gotten justice without this courageous family. However, we can't forget about just how courageous Darlene, Patricia, and Monica were as well. These parents loved their daughter beyond belief and would have sacrificed their own lives for hers that night. And that love gave three victims justice. That love stopped the hate of this monster. And from what I got from this story is that love always wins. Love is always stronger than hate, even if it doesn't seem possible. Even if a 135 pound woman, 160 pound man had to go up against a 245 pound man with a weapon determined to create violence. And yet somehow they were able to get him down and hold him until police arrived. They were able to make sure that he didn't harm any of them except for cuts on Jeannie's hands but she went after that knife without a care in the world that it was cutting her. And that kind of strength just shows you how strong love is. So I hope the McDonough family and Patricia Brooks are out there living the best possible life that they can. I hope that they are getting the help they need to heal and to not live their lives in fear. So don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay.